and we're back. Welcome back and happy Tuesday. Today, we will continue on with Linear Model 2, finishing up our treatment of all the wonderful things you can do with a seemingly very weak, impoverished linear model, our humble perceptron. So when we last left off, we talked about bias variance, and we had an expression for out-of-sample error for a given hypothesis indexed by a data set. We also took the expectation with respect to instantiations of data sets. And for this, we had for all of the data points that probability describing the vector instantiations x, we took that expectation of the mean squared error, or squared error of loss, between our final best hypothesis g and our unknown target function. And so we came up with an expression that we called our bias and our variance. And so when we looked at bias, we said our bias was the difference between the best high, final best hypothesis we can have, the best we can do, G bar across all data sets, and our unknown target function. And then the variance, we said, talked about the way in which you search for that final best hypothesis. Given that an instantiation of data gives rise to a different final best hypothesis. And that variance says for a given set of vectors, x, we take the difference between our final best hypothesis for a given data set on all those vectors and the best we can do across all data sets, namely g bar. And so we said that when you select a hypothesis, you should select a hypothesis that minimizes the bias and the variance. Both of these matter. And we saw that with an example between a constant function for a hypothesis and the line, and we found that the constant function was the better alternative when you have a data set of size 2 sampled from an unknown target function, which was a sinusoid. All right. So a lot of things we've done at this juncture with a linear classifier. We looked at the simple PLA and we modified that with a pocket of value that admitted a new weight vector if that new weight vector resulted in a reduction in out of sample error or in sample error because you're training. And then we took away that sign and used just the score and we came up with an expression for regression, our pseudo-inverse. So that same linear model, using just the score, we can solve using pseudo-inverse. Now, we take our linear model and we put it through a so-called soft threshold and get something called logistic regression, which will help us learn not a classifier or regression, but it will help us learn a probability. And so this logistic regression, which we'll talk about today, the focus of today, will complete our discussion about the basic linear model. So let's take a look first at nonlinear transformations. We have our feature vector in D dimensions, and we augment that with dummy variable x naught, which we said was fixed to 1. And through our so-called phi function, this phi function represents an arbitrary nonlinear function that you can compute over our entire input vector in d plus 1 dimensions. And so each one of these phi functions, and you can have as many of them as you want, will give you some feature in so-called z space or feature space. So we start out with our original input space, input space, and through our phi function, and we have a bank of them, we get an equivalent point in so-called feature space. And so now, when we look at feature space, because we can have an arbitrary number of these phi functions, one for each feature, we have a new dimensionality in feature space, d tilde, where it's not the case that d tilde is equal to d. So they're not equal to one another. 
Of course, this phi function can be expansive. That means that d tilde is bigger than d. We increase in dimension. It can be contractive. That means d tilde is less than d. We decrease in dimensionality. Or it can just change the geometry without changing the dimensionality. d tilde is precisely equal to our original input space dimensionality, d. And so, for example, you can imagine the following transformation in the z space. So here we describe each one of the five functions. And let's say we start out with our input space, each xi, is drawn from R super 2, two-dimensional real value space. And so each vector, xi, consists of the first feature, xi1, and xi2. Now, of course, if we augment that with x0, we get each vector xi augmented is equal to our x0, our xi1, and xi2. And so if we go from R2 through, you can imagine, all of the terms for the quadratic expansion, the quadratic polynomial, we'd have a phi function or equivalent point in Z space that has one X1 feature, X2 feature from the original input space, the cross term X1 times X2, and then X1 squared and X2 squared for total dimensionality of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And so here, each z is drawn from six-dimensional real value space. So we have a transformation from R2 to R6. And so if we then take our feature space z and learn a linear hypothesis, this is equivalent to learning a nonlinear hypothesis in the equivalent input space representation. Now, the good news is that the price you pay, complexity-wise, is the same as you would otherwise in training TLA for this linear hypothesis, but you get the expressiveness of a nonlinear decision boundary because of this nonlinear transformation, our phi function. And so our hypothesis, our linear model, exists in feature space. And so if we are given our x in input space, we compute phi on it, and then we learn our weight vector w tilde, where w tilde corresponds to the dimensionality of our z space representation. We have our z naught, and then we have our z1 through z d tilde, so d tilde plus one dimensions in z space. And so for the classifier in z space, we take our input and we compute our phi function, and then we take w tilde transpose for that result thing z point in z space, and then we take the sign of that. Now, of course, that's for classification in z space. If we were doing regression in z space, we would just compute the score and just drop sign. All right. So from a standpoint of complexity, if we look at the original input space representation, well, it's d plus 1 is our VC dimension. But if we go to Z space, that complexity grows. The VC dimension is at most d tilde plus 1. Now, remember, when we talk about VC dimension, we talk about the effective degrees of freedom, the so-called effective sort of binary degrees of freedom. So... With this transformation, if this transformation is in polynomial time, we get this expressiveness, this increased VC dimension. And so suppose we're given a set of data points, and it's tempting to want to use a nonlinear model in our representation, and you could choose to use that nonlinear model. I'll draw your attention to the inset up top, upper left-hand corner, and we see a set of data points that are nonlinear, but only slightly so. We have a point here that's misclassified, and you have a point here that's misclassified, but the majority of them are linearly separable. Now, of course, one of the things you could do is decide to go to a high-dimensional Z-space. 
Now, in going to that high dimensional Z space, again, we said the cost you pay, our increased VC dimension, is this D tilde plus one. Now, of course, that's a high price to pay because it justifies needing a lot more data in order for learning to generalize well out of sample. And so the question you ask yourself then, is it better to use a linear model in X space or to pay that extra cost to insist that in sample error is zero by transforming to Z space and paying the associated cost with the increased VC dimension? It's a higher order surface and for the same number of data points, that means you're gonna have bad generalization. And so sometimes it's better to use the linear model and just accept and come to terms with the fact that in sample error is gonna be non-zero because you want generalization, your model to generalize well. All right, but there are other problems where the data is highly non-separable. Take, for example, this data problem. In two dimensions, R super two, so D equals two, R super D, where D equals two. And here you have the blue points in the center and you have the red points at the extremes away from the center. Now, of course, this is highly nonlinear. Most of the points, all of the points, the vast majority of the points are arranged in a fashion that they're nonlinearly separable. So, of course, let's say you went to this new feature space representation. You went to this six-dimensional representation using the terms of quadratic. So you have one x1, x2, cross term x1, x2, x1 squared, x2 squared. Now, of course, your VC dimension has increased because D tilde here is now six dimensions, whereas it started out at the outset unadulterated with two dimensions, and you could augment it with x0. But we could take a look at the data, and we decide, well, we know that based on the geometry of the data, and we can see that in the scatter plot, that it makes sense to measure radially how each, comp each X and Y component, or first feature and second feature, plays out away from the origin in this two-dimensional representation. And so in doing so, you might say, okay, well, we keep our X naught, our dummy variable one, and we might transform our full six-dimensional representation. All we need really uh, to distinguish the blue points from the red points is just to take that X1 and square it and the X2 and square it. And that is a sort of polar transform that measures or represents the radial distance from origin along each of the axes for all of the points in our in-sample data. So then if you did that transformation yourself, you could go down to three dimensions, so we cut it in half and get a sort of complexity discount. And then we could go even further and say, well, we don't even need x1 squared and x2 squared. We can combine them, just add them together. x1 squared plus x2 squared, okay. That gets us down to two dimensions. And then you don't even need those two dimensions. You could compute, for example, x1 squared plus x2 squared minus 0.6. And that would get you down to one dimension, and it would characterize whether something is internal to the circle or external to the circle. So that would be our ideal representation. We get a complexity discount because the VC dimension is at its smallest for that last version of the feature space where the five function is x1 squared plus x2 squared minus 0.6. But in doing this, what did we do? We looked at the data and we used the geometry of the data to determine what type of hypothesis should be crafted. And then if you do so, you're effectively doing model selection and you have to charge for it in the VC dimension sense of the original data set. And so whenever you decide on what model to use, you can't examine the data because your examination of the data is a type of hypothesis selection. And doing so is bad for your out of sample error because you're doing the work of what model selection should be doing. You can examine the problem, but you can't peek or snoop into the data because you have to charge for that peeking into the data, that model selection in the VC dimension sense of the word. And so this looking at the data has a name, it's called data snooping. And so you don't want to get caught with your hands in the proverbial cookie jar. Don't data snoop because you're gonna pay for it 
with worse out of sample error. So let's take a look at our last component, logistic regression. And so our humble friend, the linear model, consists of a term, a weighted sum, of each one of the parameters of our linear hypothesis with each one of the features from our input representation. And we computed that sum, including our dummy variable x0 and our dummy variable w0 that absorbed the threshold. And so we ended up with a score, as we called it. It's the sum for i goes from 1 to d of wi xi. And so we take that score and we wrap it in a sign, a hard threshold that says, is it positive or negative? And we depict that graphically looking at each one of the input features from our vector, our input data, comes in here as inputs. And then the weighted sum itself is this colored in triangle. And then our hard threshold, is it positive or negative? So it returns a plus one here or minus one, depending on whether something is greater than zero on that side or less than zero on that side. So that's our hard threshold that gives us classification when we take that score and pass it through a hard threshold. And when we learn a hypothesis, we're searching through the set of weight vectors so that the hard threshold for the working hypothesis outputs a set of plus one and minus one outputs for each input data in sample that matches the labeling action of the unknown target function. And so then if we remove that hard threshold and just go with the raw score itself, it allows us to find a hypothesis that selects real valued labels. We call that linear regression. And we saw that we use a pseudo inverse to solve for the weight vectors associated with matching the scores or the real values assigned by the unknown target function. And so now with logistic regression, what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace our hard threshold or our identity threshold in the case of regression, we're gonna replace that with a so-called soft threshold, a so-called sigmoid function. And the sigmoid function will represent a probability. And so what this sigmoid does, it's called the soft threshold because it fits between the hard threshold, our sine function, and the linear threshold, which is our identity function. And we interpret that again as a probability. So this is the logistic function, uh, theta of s, our function that we input the score into, is e to the s upon 1 plus e to the s. We divide numerator and denominator by e to the s, and we get 1 upon 1 plus e to the minus s. And if we were to draw out what the sigmoid function looks like, it's this sort of scooping squiggle here, and it kind of looks like a flattened out S character. And as we see the score is beyond a certain point, we get closer and closer to one. If it's below negative a certain point, it's closer and closer to zero. And so this H of X represents a particular sigmoid parameterized by the score, where the score is the weighted sum, or W transpose X. And so you have a different sigmoid output depending on the weight vector instantiation uh, for that score, or associated with that score. And we interpret this output as a probability. And so let's say we have an input vector X, and it includes all of the attributes, uh, such as somebody's cholesterol, some health statistics like the age, um, certain biometric measurements, for example. And let's say our score our, represents a notion of risk, how risky you are. And the output of the sigmoid function on that score would represent a probability, for example, like the probability of having or suffering from a heart attack. And so this hypothesis, H of X, our sigmoid function, our logistic function on the score, is interpreted as a probability. And how we think of this probability is as if our input data X has noisy labels. And we said when we have our label instance pairs, X, Y, they're governed by a probability P of Y given X. And so it just so happens that for the unknown target function, 
you get the probability of y given x is the output of f of x, a target function. That's the probability associated with the plus one label where y equals plus one. And then one minus that f of x is going to be the probability for the alternate assignment uh, for y equals minus one, our negative label. And so the target function, unknown target function, in the case of logistic function, is going to input a real valued vector in d dimensions, that's our customer data, and it's going to output a probability, which is a number drawn between, in the closed interval, from 0 to 1 on the real numbered line. And so this particular assignment of probabilities to vector instantiations is precisely what we're trying to learn when we talk about so-called logistic regression. And so we're trying to learn some final best hypothesis G such that when you give it X, it computes this logistic function on the score W transpose X. And we hope that that score, that logistic over W transpose X is very close to the action of our unknown target function on X. All right. And so what we're going to do then for an error measurement, we want to encode the coincidence between the hypothesis acting on the in-sample data and the ground truth target function. Now, because it's a likelihood, we need to know what is the plausible error or how likely it is for Y given a particular X. And so we want a conditional probability of a certain label Y given an input vector instantiation x. And so if I give you a binary output y, and this binary output is affected by probability, then the y values you have are related to probability. So what does that mean exactly? Well, we have probability of y given x is f of x, the output of the target function, for positive labels, and that's the associated probability with a positive label, and then 1 minus the output of the target function is the probability associated with y equals minus 1, the minus label. And so how we grade a hypothesis is according to its coincidence in assigning plus 1 labels with the same probabilities and minus 1 labels with the same probabilities as the unknown target function. So we're going to grade hypotheses according to how likely it was the target hypothesis that generated the data, assuming that H was equal to F, that hypothesis was equal to F. How plausible or believable was it that the particular hypothesis or working hypothesis is equal to F? And we do that by measuring the coincidence on the labels, ground truth, between the hypothesis and the unknown target function. And so if we compute H of X, we said from before, is our sigmoid evaluated on the score W transpose X. Now, a note, an important note, is that when you have your sigmoid, sigmoid evaluated on the minus of the score is the same as 1 minus the sigmoid of X. And so here, we have the probability of Y given X, and we're going to compute the sigmoid of Y times W transpose X to the score. And that's going to be our expression for the probability. You'll notice that is always a positive value. Now, for IID data set, independent and identically distributed, you're going to have your label instance pairs, X1, Y1, up to and including Xn, Yn. And so, as a likelihood, by this IID assumption, we're going to compute the product probability of Y given X for each one of our N many data points. And so we get now this probability, the super product, n goes from 1 to big N, of probability of y given xn. Now, of course, for our expression in terms of h of x, we would take the product for n goes from 1 to big N of sigmoid evaluated on y times the score w transpose xn. All right. So now that we've done that, let's clean up this expression quite a bit. Now this expression is a little bit more difficult to understand. We have a product there, and it's going to be hard to work with that product. And so we're going to compute 
a set of so-called monotonic functions on our expression, our super product n goes from 1 to big N of sigmoid of y times the score w transpose x x. And so what a monotonic function corresponds to, and we will, for the definition of monotonic, we'll go with our strict definition. And it says for alpha in the range between 0 and 1 on the real number line, a function f of x is monotonic if f of alpha times a plus 1 minus alpha times b is less than equal to alpha times f of a minus plus 1 minus alpha times f of b. So what does that say? Well, here we have a function, and let's just draw a function that's monotonic, and we have point A here, and we have point B. Now, of course, on that function, this is our f of x, we have this point, that point here is f of A, our function evaluated on A. This next point, that's f of B, f of B. Now, if we were to look at this expression, alpha times A plus 1 minus alpha times B, that's everything in this range. Any point here is alpha times A plus 1 minus alpha times B. Now, of course, what it's saying is the function evaluated on any of these points is going to be less than alpha times F of A plus 1 minus alpha times f of b. So this line, this chord here, from f of a to f of b, that chord points along that line is going to be that alpha times f of a plus 1 minus alpha times f of b. Now, of course, you'll notice here that all of the points on this line are greater than or equal to, or conversely, all of the points on our function are less than or equal to all the points on this line. And that's what it means to be convex, and what it means um, that's an important uh, quantity or quality. And so when we have a monotonic transformation, a monotonic transformation means that it preserves the order. Suppose we have a number sequence, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we have a transformation, f of x is equal to 2x. And so this f of x equals to 2x means what? Well, this 0 becomes 0, that becomes 2, 4, 6, 8. Now, of course, if we had an optimization and we wanted to know what is the middle of the sequence, well, the middle of the sequence starts out as the third item in order from left to right. And if we do this monotonic transformation, the middle from the beginning, from the left, that position doesn't change when you compute the middle. So a monotonic transformation is a type of function that preserves the relative ordering of numbers in some sequence. Okay. And so we're going to perform a number of monotonic transformations to try to clean up this expression. Now, the natural log is a monotonic transformation, okay? Multiplication by a scalar, as we saw here, is a monotonic transformation. So that scalar could be 1 over n. And then negating is also a monotonic transformation. But when we negate, the maximization problem becomes a minimization problem. And so we start out wanting to maximize this likelihood across all the data points over the whole data set. Now, that maximizing the likelihood, looking at the coincidence, is the same as minimizing the negation of that likelihood. Now, of course, monotonistically, if we take 1 over n multiplied by a scalar and we take the natural log, it's still the same optimizer value of w that we're considering. 
So we're going to now minimize this different expression. Now, when we minimize this expression, mathematically, negative of the log is the same as log of 1 over, i.e., the reciprocal of the parameter inside that log. And so we can absorb that negative sign, leading negative sign. That's just ln of whatever that quantity is inside the log, and we raise it to the minus 1 power. So that's just 1 upon n, ln of the product, uh, n goes from 1 to big N, of 1 upon our sigmoid of y times the square w transpose xn. All right. So now that we have that transformation, now we're going to take that log. Now, log of a product is a set of sums. And so now we have 1 upon n, the sum for n goes from 1 to big N, of natural log of 1 over sigmoid of y times the score w transpose xn. All right. So now that we have that, substitute in what that sigmoid function looks like. Now, of course, if we have 1 over 1 plus e to the minus s in the denominator, that's the same as 1 plus e to the minus score. Now, of course, our score, that value, we said our s, we said it's y times w transpose x. And we said it's y times w transpose x because we always wanted it to be positive. If y is positive, when w transpose x is positive, it's positive. If y is negative, when w transpose x is negative, it's also positive. So we want that score to be strictly positive. So we have our e expression for in-sample error, which is 1 upon n, sum for n goes from 1 to big N of ln of 1 plus e to the minus y w y n w transpose x n. Now, of course, this expression has a name. Uh, it's called cross entropy error. And it's cross entropy because it refers to the coupling or the coincidence between the unknown target unknown target function and the working hypothesis. The action of the unknown target function is in our label, yn, and the working hypothesis is in the w transpose xn, which is the score part. So that's the coincidence between the target function, our yn, and the hypothesis, our w transpose xn. All right. So this is linear regression. And in closed form, when we came upon a solution, W, we used the pseudo inverse. And logistic regression, we can't perform this search in closed form. We can't solve for it in closed form. And because of this, we need an iterative approach using gradient descent. And so this cross entropy measure is convex. That's where that convexity comes in. It's a convex function. And because it's a convex function, it has a desirable property that it has a global minimum that can be reached using a local gradient. So how do you do this? We need a method then for nonlinear optimization. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the gradient of in-sample error and walk down the gradient using hill climbing. So we start out at time zero, W0, our first instantiation of the weight vector, our first hypothesis that we're searching. And we're going to take a step along the steepest slope. And so we're going to use a fixed step size. And that fixed step size is controlled by eta. And eta is going to be in the direction of the steepest gradient or the steepest slope. And so we get the weight vector at time instant 1, W of 1, is equal to W at time T0 plus eta in the direction v hat, which is the direction of steepest descent. And so here, if we look at what this nonlinear optimization is doing, we have our weight values along the horizontal axis, and we have in-sample error, e in, along the vertical axis. And so we take a step based on where the gradient is. If we know the gradient is going in this direction, we take a step in that direction of size eta. And then we recompute it and take a step in that direction of size eta. 
And so because we know that this cross entropy loss is convex, we know that it has only a single minimum and that the local gradient walking down that local gradient is guaranteed to give us uh, the one minimum, that global minimum. And it's not going to be susceptible to poor initialization. But this just begets the next question. What exactly is the direction, v hat, of this gradient of steepest descent for in-sample error? And so when we look at optimization in general, the surface is indicative of what typically happens in practice. Along the two axes on the bottom plane, we have our two parameters. And then along the third axis, we have a scoring function. And so typically what happens when you do gradient descent, it's almost like you're rolling a marble down the hill. And when it arrives, it could come into contact with a flat area, a gradient that goes to zero, but not be in the global minimum. That would be a local minimum. And so when you do optimization and you're walking down the gradient using gradient descent, like in logistic regression, having that convexity means that among your local minima is going to be some global minima. And so here we have some local minima, and it's akin to taking a marble and rolling it down the surface, setting it rolling down this multidimensional surface. And so if it comes into this valley here, this local min, it'll stop there. And then the key then is how you keep this marble going downhill and you kind of jiggle it, shake it a little bit to get it out of the local minimum. And that's called Brownian motion and you use randomization to do that. And so we have a bunch of local minima and among those minima is a global minimum, the smallest of the local minima. And that's what you're after when you're learning. And so how do you minimize EA? You take a start at W naught, and then you take a step, a fixed step size in the direction of steepest slope. And so you say W1 is equal to W naught plus your step eta in the direction of steepest gradient. And so this question of what's the gradient uh, is really important. Let's take a look at that. Um, it's not susceptible to poor initialization because it is convex this cross entropy error and in practice you don't get to see the surface you only see local information such as the local slope so this is a good property this idea that it will find the global minimum uh, if as long as it's convex and so in logistic regression we do the solving of this in sample error through an iterative approach that makes use of the gradient so we're going to do iterative gradient as the method for searching for that final best hypothesis. So, okay, so we said that we take a step in the direction of steepest step. So we have our gradient, gradient of in sample error, gradient of EN, and that's nothing more than the difference at in EN at time T1 minus the difference in in sample error at our initial time T0. So we have EN of W1 minus EN of W0. And so now, because we're approximating, we're assuming a constant slope at that point at time zero, and then walking down that slope, that eta amount at a time. And so we can rewrite this gradient of in-sample error by substituting what it means to say W1. W1 is just W0 plus N times V hat, where this V hat is uh, the direction of steep ascent, and this N or eta, more correctly, uh, is going to be the step size. And so we fill in our definition of what W1 is here, and now we take a look at how we compute this rate of change. And so this rate of change, then, if we were to take the constant slope, slope at that point W0, and we said we walk out eta in the direction along that gradient. And so here we have eta times the gradient at W0, and we're going to multiply that, so transpose, times this V hat, which is the direction of that steepest gradient. Now, of course, how do you compute this? 
you can use a Taylor series approximation. The Taylor series is just the derivative times the difference. And that makes the assumption it's a linear projection, a linear interpolation, and where the slope of that linear interpolation is based on the derivative. Okay. And so when we look at this, we're going to ignore all of the higher order terms from this Taylor series. And we're going to pay attention to the first order term when we compute this gradient, which is just the first derivative at that particular point, uh, W naught. And so if we look at this gradient, the gradient varies between two extremes. It can be the smallest possible value, which is the largest magnitude negative value, on through the largest magnitude positive value. And so the smallest value possible is the negative of the gradient the gradient that's aligned or opposite the unit vector in the opposite direction, and the maximum magnitude is the norm of that gradient. And so we know that this expression that we're interested in, this step size eta in the direction of steepest descent, and it's governed by the gradient, this en, that's the slope, and then this is the distance eta, and if we were to look at this, that would be at least, because this is the smallest value, the magnitude of the negative of that gradient. And so here we have the magnitude of the gradient, we have the step size eta, because that's going to be the smallest version of the step size, and we negate it because it's in the negative direction where we get the smallest. Okay. So now that we have this expression, we know that this is the magnitude of the gradient at W naught. Now, the unit vector is in the opposite direction of the quantity you're trying to minimize. And if we want the unit vector, what do we want? We want it to normalize this unit vector. So how do we normalize this unit vector? Okay, well, we take the gradient of En at W naught, and then that direction, because remember we want this v hat, is just going to take that gradient of e in at w naught, and we're going to divide it by the magnitude of that gradient of e in at w naught. And that's going to be our direction, rather, or the unit vector corresponding to the direction of steepest ascent based on that gradient. All right. So let's take a look at the effect of step size. So if the step size is really, really small, what's going to happen is that our gradient, that's the amount that we're going to reduce our weight when we take a step in uh, the steepest direction, it's going to be very, very small. And so here we have our weight vector. Our weight vector is going to change from one step to the next. Our in-sample error is going to drop a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Now, of course, that will work, but it will take too long to converge down to uh, en equals zero, smallest in-sample error, or minimization of our in-sample error. Now, if our step size is too large, our step is going to be really big, and we have a risk, or run the risk, of overshooting uh, the global minimum. And so we're going to make a big leap, and then we're going to make a big leap, and we're going to make a big leap, because eta is a very large projection along that direction oriented with the slope of steepest descent. So this is what happens if it's too large. You're going to overshoot it. And what we really want is we want a variable step size. We want the step size to be large when in-sample error is large because we want to make big jumps to reduce that in-sample error dramatically. But as we get closer and closer and closer to the global minimum, we want that step size to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So what we really want is we want a learning rate that's proportional to the magnitude of the gradient so it can scale up and down depending on how near you are. And that's almost like driving. If you want to get to a certain destination, literally like in front of a house, if you're far away, you're going to go faster. And then as you get closer and closer to the house, you start to slow down a little bit. And maybe you're five feet from the house. You're going to be inching your car forward very, very slowly. You don't drive 50 miles an hour and then jam on the brakes right as you're at the house. That doesn't work very well. You overshoot your destination. And so 
instead of setting the change that we desire in our weight vector as we're walking down the gradient uh, proportional to eta, our step size, in the direction of steepest descent, our vector v hat, well, we want to adjust it, make it variable relative to the size of the gradient. And so from before, we said that V hat was the gradient of E in at W naught divided by its magnitude. Now, of course, what we want is our W to be proportional to the gradient of E in at that particular weight vector, W naught, for example. And so what do we do then? Well, we're going to multiply our expression for the gradient by the gradient magnitude. And if we multiply this expression here by the gradient magnitude, that's multiplying it by the magnitude of the gradient E in W naught, well, the denominators cancel and we're left with a learning rate times the gradient of E in at W naught. Now, of course, this eta is fixed and this eta is part of this expression that uses this variable gradient of E in to adjust to make this delta W, the change in weight vector, larger in proportion to the size of the gradient. Okay. And so this gives you a proportional expression for the change in weight vector that's proportional to the gradient magnitude. And that's really what we desire so that we get this behavior that we saw in the previous slide. It's a variable step. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller the closer you get to your minimum in in-sample error surface. Okay, so this is the final algorithm for logistic regression. You start out in step one, initialize uh, some weights, and you have a series of rounds for T equals zero to one to two, etc. And you're going to start out, you're going to compute the gradient of cross entropy error. Now, this is the expression for the gradient of cross entropy error. And if you call cross entropy error, it had one over n, it had a sum, and it had an ln of one plus e to the y and w transpose xn. Now, of course, if minus. Of course, if you take the derivative, right, the derivative of ln of any quantity is 1 over that quantity. So that's how we get 1 over e to the y and w transpose xn. And then if we take that minus y n w transpose xn, and that's the composition e to the u, and we take that chain rule, du, d, w, well, we get this minus sign here, and we get that yn, xn. Okay. So now we get this expression for the gradient of the cross entropy error, and that's our gradient of en. And we then update our weight vector at, for the next round, w at round t plus 1, is equal to w at time t, the current weight, minus our step size eta times the gradient of e in that we just computed. And so we iterate this again and again and again until you either exhaust the number of rounds or it's time to stop. And that time to stop means that this gradient of e in gets so, so small that its change is not more than 1 to 5%. It doesn't change more than a minimal amount. And then we halt or we stop. And then you output the final weight vector, W. And so this tuning of our change in weight vector relative to the magnitude of the gradient, it slows down the search to smaller step sizes as you get closer and closer to the global minimum. And you guarantee it's global minimum because this cross entropy error is convex. Okay. So this all started with a seemingly very simple linear model for credit analysis.
And we started with the perceptron, which was a linear model with a hard threshold. And that output a plus one or minus one label for credit approval or credit denial. Now, we took our classification error, in-sample error, and we improved upon it using the pocket for pocket PLA. Then we also talked about removing this hard threshold when we talked about real-valued labels, the score for the amount of credit. And we posed our linear model, our so-called linear regression, and we used pseudo-inverse to find that W in closed form. And we use the squared error loss function in order to measure the amount of coincidence between the working hypothesis and the unknown target function. Moreover, we use this linear regression or pseudo inverse solution as a bootstrap for the perceptron is a good starting place for a good initialization for a weight vector to the perceptron. Then now we looked at the probability associated with approval or default. And we introduced logistic regression and we changed that function from a hard threshold to the soft threshold using the sigmoid function. Our error measure of coincidence between the working hypothesis and the unknown target function was cross entropy error and we used the maximization of the likelihood that the particular working hypothesis generated labels mimicking the probability associated with the unknown target function, probability of assigning plus one labels to a given input vector and minus one labels to a given input vector. And so we used gradient descent in order to search for that particular weight vector and using a gradient descent approach where the change in weight vector from one iteration to the next was informed or proportional or informed by the magnitude of the error gradient. And so it just says here, we have the same linear model, but by changing things like the algorithm for search, uh, the function that we're trying to search for, our hypothesis set, and adding simple things like a pocket, like a regression pseudo-inverse bootstrap, 